Bring it up. Warriors returning from a war, the Kennedy Air Wing comes home from Desert Storm. But that was a year ago, and now Air Wing 3 is getting ready to leave again. Typically, about half the squadron personnel leave on its return. New air crews and support people arrive, and the next months are spent learning to be a squadron again. Fighters fight. Bombers bomb. And radar planes track targets. It's a time called workups, but there's one important thing missing. They don't really work together. That is, until a trip to the other side of the country to Fallon, Nevada. This has got to be the darndest place to find a naval air station you've ever seen. The nearest water is hundreds of miles away. This place is nothing but sand and mountains, and yet that may be appropriate. For a lot of the pilots who are here, it must remind them of a place they were one year ago, a place called Saudi Arabia. But Navy flyers trained here long before the Gulf War. Yet this remote dot in the high desert assumed new importance in the mid-80s. In December 1983, Navy jets from the carriers Kennedy and Independence attacked Syrian targets in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. They did little damage, and two were shot down. Lieutenant Mark Lang was killed. Lieutenant Robert Goodman was captured. Both were from Oceana. Any third world country now, with a billion dollars of oil money, can buy a very respectable integrated air defense system, and a lot of them have. The world had changed. Vietnam-era tactics would no longer work. The Navy had to get better at strike warfare. It already had a graduate school for fighter pilots, Top Gun. We needed one for power projection. So then Secretary of the Navy John Lehman, himself an A-6 bombardier navigator, created the Naval Strike Weapons Center, Strike University at Fallon. Captain Park Here's helped sort of plan it. From the initial go on this thing, it was up and running and manned in about six months. Well, tell me what you're doing here. What Air Wing commanders like CAG Doug Connell have brought their squadrons here ever since. Nowhere else in the country do I have the combination of training tools that I need to get the job done as cheaply or as effectively. Part of that is due to the fact that Fallon is in the middle of nowhere, 60 miles east of Reno. This is great flying out here. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. The weather is absolutely beautiful. We have uh, premium targets. A lot of good ranges. Uh, not a whole lot of civilian traffic to worry about. Slam it all the way home. Today, on one range, 40 miles away, a close air support exercise with the Marines. Your target this run is about 1,000 south of your last target. Four. They mark the target two and a half miles away with white phosphorus shells from two howitzers. There's the mark. He's going to bomb the southern group of tanks there. Besides tanks, there are target airfields with aircraft, even a terrorist training camp. There he is, over the tower to the right. He's low. Nice. With the advent of Strike University, Fallon became more useful and more high-tech. We'll watch the event as it's actually being flown. This is the Tactical Air Crew Combat Training System, or TACS, a huge computer that can monitor and record an entire battle. There's a similar system at NAS Oceana, but nothing this big. We can replay the entire strike for them. We can sit there and, again, give them a good God's eye view of how they did. 
the computer scores dogfights. There you go. There's the missile coming off. A little coffin will come up on the, uh, around the, uh, the aircraft that just been killed. It monitors bomb runs. There you see it. A bomb head. They look pretty good. And shots at enemy missile sites. And there's the missile right there. T2 is active, so it should guide on that SAM site. Before tax, the winner of such a battle was the side that told the best story. And we just lost a, a good guy on that one. Yes, we got to the target. We killed all the boogies on the way in. We put our bombs on target, and we got back. But now the computer doesn't lie. And it's kind of nice, because now it takes a lot of the, uh, the first guy back to the chalkboard out of it and uh, wins the fight. Rendezvous went OK, had trouble with uh, one of the tanker packages. But beyond the tax system, Strike U is a place to develop new tactics and study strike warfare. Here's what we've seen in the past. Here's the goods, here's the bads, here's the way we think you ought to structure this to make it work for you. So just how good is this place? How accurate is Strike University? Desert Storm provided a good test. And a lot of the reactions we received from the air wings as they've come back through here since the war has been that we were right on the mark. There is, of course, one thing it can't duplicate. We didn't shoot at anybody here. We still don't. And there's no way to factor in what terror does to you or how it grabs hold of your mind and keeps it. But this training goes as far as it can. Captain Park was in Air Wing 17 on the carrier Saratoga during the war. One night, he asked a young flyer about his first mission over Iraq. And his reply was, except for the individual shooting at us, it was just like Fallon. It's a sort of gathering of the clans. The entire Kennedy Air Wing gathered here at this desert base for some very intensive training. There are squadrons from Oceana and Norfolk and as far away as Whidbey Island in the state of Washington. And Jacksonville, Florida in between. Each aircraft type has a specific purpose. The Hampton Roads, the F-14 Tomcats are fighters. The A-6 Intruders are medium bombers. The E-2 Hawkeyes are radar planes. We're the guys who look over the hill and uh, find the bad guys lurking in the shadows. And then we give the, the vectors, give the directions to fighters, tell them where they are. From Florida, the F-A-18 Hornets are both fighters and bombers. S-3 Vikings hunt submarines. There's a multi-mission helicopter squadron. And from Washington, EA-6 Prowlers. We're basically a uh, radar jammer and a harm shooter for the air wing. Our missiles home in on enemy radars and destroy them. Together, they're Air Wing 3, commanded by Captain Doug Connell, who is called K. In Air Wing 3, we have the luxury of having almost the newest model of everything. But he has an even bigger luxury. As CAG, probably the most important advance we've had lately is multi-role aircraft. The Navy simply could no longer afford to have one aircraft do only one job. So, yes, those are F-14 fighters bombing. It's a great bomber. It's got a lot of power. It can go real fast. It can get in there, and it can fight its way out and in. We're still fighters through and through, but, uh, uh, you know, really, I think they're enjoying it a lot. Tomcats also do photo reconnaissance. A6s not only bomb, they're used for aerial refueling. Even the S3 Vikings do more than hunt subs. The aircraft's got quite a few uh, sensors on board that we're able to fold into the strike warfare that's being done here. And the dual roll Hornets replace the single mission A7. A7 did the air to ground, but now the F-18 can do the air to ground and the air to air. The buzzword in Washington would be force multiplier. The airplanes can do more than one thing at once. They all get to do everything during their three and a half grueling weeks here. This is typically their first chance to get together as an entire wing, and now we fold the A6s in with all the other aircraft, the F-14s, the F-18s, the Prowers. The... 6 a.m., the first light of day, and already the Fallon flight line is alive. Ground crews check the flight line for debris, which could foul jet engines. On a far corner of the field, ordnance men begin loading weapons, both real and practice. We've got to install the wings and fins. Uh, we've got to go ahead and uh, close the pylon doors and uh, arm the aircraft and get it ready for flight. Uh... 
many weapons are loaded. This will be a big strike. It'll be about 35 airplanes. Is that right? With uh, about a dozen adversaries, probably. The air wing flies three strikes per day, which get tougher as the weeks grind on. But all are as close as possible to the real thing. The message comes in in the same format. The intelligence and operations people break the message down just like they would on the flagship at sea. The message ordering this morning's strike exercise came in 36 hours earlier, and strike planners began their work. We want to be outside the, their missile envelope, of course. The intelligence officers providing them what they see as a threat, and they're planning their tactics to go in and conduct that strike. We need to make sure that when the fighters sweep through here, we know everybody out in front of us is bad guys, so... Every detail is decided, from rendezvous points and radio frequencies to what aircraft carrying which weapons. Hey, everybody take a seat. Uh, welcome to the uh, carrier wing. A few hours before the strike, the crews gather for a briefing. Proceed to this uh, point right here, rendezvous, and then uh, commence our uh, ingress into enemy uh, territory. Uh, deception will degrade the IADs. Once this happens, you can expect heavy SAMs or a, in a barrage of SAMs and also a heavy AAA. Wing 3 will not be alone in the sky. Lurking back at the end of the runway, taking off last, the adversaries, the bad guys. They provide uh, what we hope is a realistic uh, simulation of, uh, of what we can expect to see in the real world. As the strike group heads off, it'll have other worries. The target will be defended. people are shooting at you. You get all the electronic indications that people are shooting at you. Uh, they, uh, right here in the valley, they will fire uh, flares that look like missiles being shot at you. And then there's the Sergeant York, an Army surplus air defense tank. Its radars try to lock up on the attacking planes. If it finds you, you would die. So the attackers twist and turn, drop flares to confuse heat-seeking missiles bomb the target. Bomb Call one. Continue. Time on target, 4-1. 90 minutes later, it's all over. The air wing returns. She has a target. Of course we did. Pretty good hits today. Uh, all inside of about uh, 60 feet. But of course, they won't have the last word. That'll come from the tactics computer. <laughs> After their return, the crews gather to see who hit the target, who lived, who died. And even as they do, other crews are manning other jets, heading for other targets. Redskins go to Carlisle, and they have skilled players at every different position, but they haven't operated side by side. They haven't run any plays together. What we're doing here is running plays together. If Fallon is busy for the flyers, it's even tougher for the ground crews. We're, uh, we've working 12 to 14 hours. Every day? Every day. That's a between two shift. shifts. For a young guy like Eric, it's an awesome responsibility. What happens to this E2 in the air depends on what he does to it on the ground. 
we change an engine overnight or a total radar system and the only thing that the pilot knows is if it's good or not is our signature on the bottom of a piece of paper saying that it is. Whenever one of these F-14s comes back from a mission, it won't leave again until a plane captain like Ward Baker looks at it. It's my job to take a look at the entire jet and report those problems to the various shops that are responsible for getting out here and uh, fixing the problem immediately. The harder they push these jets, the more important our job becomes. As far as my shop personally, we're holding together real tight. We've only got one plane down out of our whole squadron. When you talk to these crews, the first thing that strikes you is how young they are. Lee Niskern is 20, in charge of a $45 million airplane. I can't even fix my car, but I can fix one of these. <laughs> so what do you want to proceed with? It's busy on the A6 flight line, too. There is quite a bit of maintenance required on the A6 uh, because of the age, for one thing. The thing about this aircraft is that if you fly it uh, more, then it tends to break on you less. The breathless pace of operations here has a purpose. The overall training environment intensity here is very similar to what it was in, in uh, Iraq and Desert Storm. And for Skipper Hagen's A6s, that means not only strikes, but bomb runs with live weapons. This walleye missile, for instance, a smart bomb. It was fired at the range at China Lake, California. The crew took along our camera to record the mission. Good track. This is the view from the seeker head on the missile. Good track. It recorded the last moments of the target truck. Awesome. <laughs> Our primary mission will be a uh, low-level bombing run. Our secondary mission is to go up and get practice plugs off the KC-135. There are also runs with practice bombs, and for this one, I've been invited along for the ride. Every flight begins with a briefing. It's going to be a uh, simulated industrial complex missile sites and a missile assembly area. Here we go. Next comes the flight suit. Parachute harness, survival vest, G-suit, leg restraints, helmet liner, helmet, mask. Even after four flights in jets, it's still confusing. There always seems to be one more strap. Where's his, uh... You put the belt? Oh, belt went inside. My fault. Is that how the composite wings now? Is that one of them? We've got, we've got the two airplanes that have composite wings. Uh, My pilot is Lieutenant Commander Steve Tagriello. You name it, Tags has been there. Desert Storm, Grenada, Libya, and Lebanon. Our plane captain today. Hey, Mr. Tagriello. The A-6 carries an incredible bomb load, 11,000 pounds. That's more than a World War II heavy bomber. But to Tag's delight, today we're carrying nothing. Okay, normally you've got bomb racks, bombs, drop tanks. It's completely split, not even a center line. So this thing is going to be a hot ship today. We'll be flying as one plane in a four-plane division on a typical training flight. Once airborne, we join up and head north to a waiting Air Force KC-135 tanker to practice refueling. One by one, the planes try their hand. It's a lot tougher than it looks, but these jets refuel from Air Force tankers on almost every Desert Storm mission. When it's our turn, it gets even tougher. The tanker starts a turn. The trick to refueling is to get stabilized behind the basket. We get uh, behind the basket about three feet, get the airplane all trimmed up and stabilized, and it's just a very gentle maneuver, getting two or three knots of closure, and uh, just gently putting the probe into the basket. Tags nails it on his first try. Next, our division forms up and heads for the range. A low-level bombing run, screaming along at 500 miles per hour, 200 feet above the desert. The A-6 on our wing will drop a snake eye practice bomb. Fins will slow it down so it hits behind us instead of under us. But watch, the fins don't deploy and we pull hard to get out of the way. 
Had that been a real bomb, we could have been in real trouble. Next, a roller coaster ride of a maneuver called a pop-up. The pop-up uh, maneuver is to keep the airplane moving in three dimensions of space to make it uh, more difficult to track. After 15 minutes, our division forms up and heads for home. It's been a good mission, and for TAGS, it's a good life. It's the greatest job in the world, Terry. I've uh, been flying him for about 12 years now, and I enjoy the heck out of it.